This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. You okay, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Before we dive into the topic, which is your recent article on the dollar's dominance, I want to remind our listeners that the Mises Institute is giving away 100,000 copies of Murray Rothbard's classic, What Has Government Done to Our Money? And these things are moving fast. So if you want to get your free copy, you got to go ahead and do it sooner rather than later. So to go to Mises.org slash H-A-Pod free. So that's human action pod free, right? So Mises.org slash H-A-Pod free. You give your information. You can get one or even multiple copies of Rothbard's classic, you know, hand it out to the local kids in the neighborhood who need to understand what did government, in fact, do to our money? And so, apropos of that, uh, Joaquin, can you explain, you know, what, why did you choose to write on this this topic? And we'll start getting into some of the particulars. Right, okay. So my, my background is economic history, and I focused on the history of central banks, things like that. And so for a long time, I've been thinking about dynamics between different monies and currencies, things like that. Um, and so I was aware of this sort of literature of uh, portfolio shares and FX reserves and, and, and things changing and how the dollar overtook the, the British pound sterling in the early portions of the 20th century. Um, and then in the last 20 something years, that share of the, the dollar's dominance basically has, uh, has come down like very, very gradually and very sort of flying a little bit under the radar. I know a lot of gold bugs have uh, have given attention to this and, and looked at it now and again, um, but I wasn't really aware that it had dropped below 60% of the um, of, uh, of central bank reserve holdings. And then you had the entire geopolitical thing with Russia and China, no longer holding treasuries, Russia not holding treasuries in China, and like dialing it back a little bit, Russia getting kicked off SWIFT, all of these things had me thinking about the role of the dollar in the global financial system and the global monetary system, what that means for money, things like that. So that was the background for uh, for what I was like, why I was looking at this. Okay, great. Yeah. So we start going through some of this and this dovetails, folks, um, if you listen to this podcast a lot, you know, I recently was on a zero hedge debate. Jim Rickards was on my side and we were arguing that the, the US dollar will forfeit its global reserve status, um, and the people on the other side, we, we had the specific timetable. And so you can go look at that uh, debate as well if you want to see my take on this. But that's why I wanted to have Joachim on because it's a lot of this stuff. I, our conclusions might end up being different, but you you hit on all the same issues. And like you said, if I had kind of known that, oh, yeah, ever since 71 at least, there's been some people claiming, oh, yeah, the dollar's dead, stick a fork in it. And then that keeps not happening. And I had seen statistics about the the prevalence of the dollar in foreign transactions. And it's and so I was a bit taken aback when I was getting ready. Well, I wasn't getting ready for the debate. I was doing something else last fall when someone asked me to write an article up on, you know, the dollar status as a reserve, international reserve currency. And I was surprised by how far in terms of the official numbers that central banks report mm. the dollar had fallen over the last 20 years. Because, yeah, at any given t- moment, if you take a snapshot, it looks like it's fine. But when you step back yeah. and look at the historical trend, you realize, no, actually, it's it's given up a lot of ground, you know, since the year 2000. So you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, totally. And if you just look at, at you know, five-year graphs or something like that, it's about the same shares. And if you look at the, some of the other metrics that we usually use, like uh, cross-border invoicing or... Um, 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 shares in, in in the actual foreign exchange markets, like how often the dollar trades against other currencies, there there is no trend. There's nothing. Like the dollar is just completely dominating everything else, and it doesn't seem to be much of a change. Um, and then if you look at a five year or, or, or two year or something like that um, for what central banks are doing or institutions are doing, there doesn't seem to be much of a change. So there's no story. And the background to that is exactly like you said. People have pronounced the dollar dead a hundred times at least. Um, and I, I use that in my article too. I, I grab some 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 quotes from Foreign Affairs and from uh, Charles Kindleberger and things from from the seventies and the eighties, saying, "Yeah, the dollar is finished. That's it. They're, it came over. All these other you know geopolitical adversaries 
there's nothing. We, we're we're going to be a multipolar world. We're not going to dominate anymore. And then it doesn't happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but but yeah. So so on the on the two first thing in cross border invoicing and uh, in 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 the foreign exchange markets, we still don't really see anything. But we definitely do see something happening. Um, and add to that the entire stuff that you guys talked about in the debate with the BRICS currencies and um, and, and Russia and China doing their own things and. Um, and some of the Middle Eastern countries trying to invoice or sell oil in something that isn't dollars. So there's there are all these things happening. So it's at least worth worth looking at. Um, I I did find I did find your timeline a little uh, like for the debate. For those of you who watched the Zero Hedge debate, it was uh, the proposition was something like dollar will lose its um, current res- current uh, global reserve currency status by the year 2030. Um, and when I heard that, I was like, "Whoa! Not even I think that's gonna happen." <laughs> that's a little yeah. like six years off. That's that's that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if it's the, the background of that is originally we had a longer window, and then it was thought if we push it out too far, no one's gonna care, and so yeah. let's make it provocative. So I'm still, you know, I'm not gonna. If, if we're wrong, we'll, we'll be we'll be wrong. I'm not just gonna say, "Oh, well, they made us put an earlier one," but I am just explaining <laughs> that yes, we we knew going into it that's very aggressive. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Totally. Okay, so so if I understood what you just said there, and I, you know, I had read your article, you're saying there's there's three things we could look at to gauge, you know, what's the dollar's role in terms of international commerce or what have you, to to gauge is this still the the king currency of the world. And you're saying there's cross-border invoicing. Um, what was the other one? The one that has and then moved? it's just uh, yeah, foreign exchange. That's just normal, like when the dollar oh, trades regular, yeah, regular foreign like exchange. Yeah. yeah. So, like when people trade one currency against another, the point is the U.S. dollar is one of those currencies way more yeah. than anything else on Earth right now. Like it's not even close. And then, um, yeah. but the one that has moved, the other, the third possibility of what, what what do we mean when we talk about the dollar's reserve currency is central banks hold forex reserves, and the dollar's share in that has has been coming down, you know, quite quite steadily for the last twenty yeah. years. Okay, and so it's nice to it's nice to how they sort of lap over to this traditional rules of money as well, with 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 cross border invoicing and, and currency exchange being sort of a medium of exchange role in the global system, and then the portfolio reserves play more of a, a store of value uh, role. So we can almost lap those roles over into. Um, um, or I'm sure we can put unit of account in there too if we want to stretch the analogy. Um, and and then we could then we can argue in a similar fashion that you know the dollar doesn't really have a store of value role or the role is eroded, um, and that works in a personal level as well. We see the dollar eroding as a store of value. You need to own something else. You need to own hard assets, um, and I think that sort of fits with the general story. But the, whereas the dollar is perfectly fine to use for paying, like between your pay, paycheck and um, buying for coffee or paying rent or something, that usually not a big problem. Right. Okay, let me read a portion of your article and then have you respond. You say, uh, monetary sanctions make the global money worse. Indeed, the extent to which they are at all effective indicates the power that U.S. officials wield over the globe's money flow. Even banks that channel non-USD payments have important corresponding accounts with American banks, which, quote, U.S. regulators have become experts at using to get jurisdiction over the whole financial world as Matt Levine observed for Bloomberg last year. The heavy American policing of money flows has incentivized incentivized foreign institutions to hold money and assets far away from the long, snooping arm of the U.S. While you abuse your monetary privilege, the defectors and pariahs are busy finding ways to construct or bootstrap alternatives. So can you just elaborate on that? Yeah, right. So the dollar or the, the U.S. role of issuing the uh, the world currency uh, comes with you know benefits and, and and obligations in a sense, and this is the argument that goes back in the literature to Charles Kindleberg, and he was talking about and and and, and in the, during the Bretton Woods era uh, and after with the problems with the trip and dilemma things like that. Uh, like once you issue the money, you are getting something for free. It's this you know deficits without tears thing that I also reference. But mm-hmm. the U.S. can run trade deficits, and they basically print debt or money. Like physical or, or digital pieces of green paper, and they hand them over to foreigners, and the foreigners give them actual goods and services in, in 
um, in exchange. So that's a good deal in general, um, but it comes with certain responsibilities. You can't hyperinflate away. If you do too much, foreigners are going to stop using it. So if you hyperinflate your currency, this privilege goes away. Um, if you, like I argue in the article, if you are using the currency, you're sort of weaponizing it, uh, by imposing sanctions, by going after what you think are criminals or cutting other people off the payment networks, those people are understandably going to stop use your currency. It's not that much, it doesn't work for them anymore. Um, if you seize foreign reserve assets from an adversary, they're going to stop putting their economic power into your system, right? So the fact that the US can use sanctions at all is an indicator of how much power they have, uh, how much how much influence this money has, basically. Um, but if, and and this is the warning as well, because if you use it too much, those people you kick off and those people you sanction and those people you censor are going to start look for alternatives. They're going to start building parallel systems. They're going to start doing things that surround your sanctions. And that's I think is one of the explanations for why we see all this like. A lot of gold buying in, in East Asia and among central banks. We see the, these initiatives around BRICS and trying to like build a new common currency. Uh, we see in the areas that I work, um, we see a lot of Bitcoin interest. Russia now has the third largest mining fleet uh, in the world. We think it's a little hard to always determine. Um, so there's definitely a lot of attempts to go around these sanctions and to build um, um rivaling parallel systems. Let me just reread one thing there just to make sure I understood. So you said, even banks that channel non-USD payments have important corresponding accounts with American banks, which, and then quoting Matt Levin, US yeah. regulators have become experts at using to get jurisdiction over the whole financial world. So the idea there, right, is that you might have thought, oh yeah, the dollar, like the US authorities, if certainly if foreigners hold checking account balances denominated in U.S. dollars with U.S. banks that are under, you know, the jurisdiction of the Fed. Certainly they can impose sanctions and say, hey, we catch any of you guys trying to send U.S. dollars mm. out of your checking account, you know, with Citibank or whatever to Moscow, then we're going to seize that. That's obvious, but you're saying it's, it's their control is much deeper than that because much any deeper. bank that, you know, Moscow wants to use probably in some way is connected to the U S dollar system. And so the authorities yeah. can just say, if we catch wind that you're trading with Russia, we'll cut you off over here where we have the authority to do so. And then that's going to so much lock you out of the global network that that's you know, even though we can't literally stop you from sending rubles to Moscow, the fact that we can chop you off yeah. over here from using us dollars effectively means you're done. Is that kind exactly. of the, what you're getting at? Yeah, that's exactly the, the idea that everything more or less touches the US dollar or the US banking system at some point. Uh, and it doesn't have to touch it directly. It's enough that it touches a bank that has correspondent correspondent accounts in New York. Uh, and that's how a lot of this global global banking system operates as well. It's between like how do you make a transfer from one country to another? It's that the bank that you're transferring from. Uh, has an account in 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 New York, and the and 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 then the foreign bank also has an account in New York, and then they do a, they do a swap. So basically, like that that is the transfer. And so if you send money from you know uh, Germany to the Middle East, uh, both of those banking institutions, because they're large and because they're global, they're going to touch the American banking system at some point, uh, which uh, the U.S. Uh, like OFAC and other like the Treasury have have used and wielded in their advantage, and basically said, "Yeah, we now have jurisdiction over that um, thing." Mm -hmm. And I used one of those examples because you know the Russia and Russia trying to buy, sorry, India trying to buy oil from Russia um, in recent years. They've tried, you know, like they have these BRICS negotiations, and then. Um, Indians obviously wanted to use rupees to pay and Russians wanted to receive rubles. So there was this like geopolitical negotiation and eventually they've decided that they were going to use um, dirhams from, uh, from, from um, Dubai. And once they had made this decision, it turned out that the Dubai bank they were using couldn't open an account for them for mysterious reasons uh, that seemed to have to do with, with banking correspondence uh, uh, with the US, for instance. So it's not like... It doesn't have to physically be an American bank or be under the jurisdiction of the Fed for them still to have influence. Because um, all of those banks could have to um, 
seize their operations with the Middle Eastern Bank or with an Indian bank. Um, so yeah, that was basically the idea, the idea that the, the reach is much, much further than just mm-hmm. American banks or the banks that the Fed directly regulates or the Treasury directly oversees. Okay, let me read another excerpt going along with this train of thought. After the 2014 Crimea annexation by Russia, sanctions imposed by the U.S., quote, created an incentive to diversify away from the U.S. dollar to avoid these sanctions when exporting to target countries such as Russia, concluded Antoine Bertau in a working paper for Bank de France last year. The numbers seemed fairly small, but more importantly, the Russians went to work de-dollarizing their assets, both public and private. In fact, concludes the report, the global shift away from dollar dependence has long been underway with functional alternative payment and bank clearing systems now operating in Russia, MER and SBFS, China, SIPS, UnionPay, and Alipay, in India, UPI. So just kind of going over some of the stuff you just, you've already mentioned here, but the, the point being it's one should not conclude just because it hasn't worked yet means everybody else just gave up and they said, well, I guess, you know, Washington, D.C. gets to run the world for the rest of time that they actually have, there have been, there are numerous alternative systems being built as we speak. Yeah, what was so fascinating to me, so my, my, my day job, basically my freelance day job is to, to spend a lot of time with, with Bitcoiners and help them editing text and research. Um, and, 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 and so I'm deep in the, in the orange world, if you will. Uh, and it's so, and, and looking at all these negotiations and the struggles of getting a bank account and how are we going to process the payment, it's just like, look, guys, there is an option here. <laughs> it's like, you don't have to be like all the way down the, the orange rabbit hole like me to think that, hey, maybe these entities can just use Bitcoin. And what is the treasury going to do? You know, like they're, they're trying to go after um, uh, cryptographers and, and open source developers, things like that. But like, you don't need to to dabble with a with a with a bank account in the Middle East or try to find some common ground or force the other guy to use your currency. There, there is a neutral global currency that we can use. Okay, I mean so that that is a, an important point that I, I do want to follow up on. But the stuff that that Bank de France report were citing, like those were traditional, more conventional systems yeah. that were just bu- being built on rails outside of the you know where the where the U.S. was the hegemon. Yeah, yeah, totally, and 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 so those are some of the the things. That, the, basically, the replacements to Visa and Mastercard, I think, in Russia, because after the 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 Ukraine invasion two years ago, Visa and Mastercard sort of stopped their services in there, as far mm-hmm. as I understand. And there was a a parallel system. Um, so you would think, from an American point of view, if you go to Russia, they just, you can, just can't pay with cards, and it's perfectly fine. You can pay with cards. They have their own like parallel uh, banking payment system set up, um, and those things started after after the Crimea. They started building them. Um, in the background, so it's not like this is a recent thing. Um, this is a bigger play. Like we talked about the, with the bricks on the on the the zero hedge debate. This this has been long in the making. Like I think Jim Rickards listed all the meetings that they've had and the stuff that they've been working on in the background. Um, so these have been going on for a long time. Yeah. So one of the things that the critics say, or the, the you know the the dollar bulls say, and they said it in the zero hedge debate, and I follow those guys on Twitter. You know, I see their their follow up is, yeah, these people can have meetings all day long, but it hasn't worked so far. And it's not just that, oh, because they were, you know, a breakdown and negotiate that there's fundamental reasons that it hasn't worked. And by the way, it's um, a lot of the people who are still saying the dollar is going to be king for a while. It's not because they're naive Keynesian, you know, inflators. Like they, they get Austrian economic. They, a lot of these people agree. I don't like the U.S., fiat dollar. You know, I, I wish it was still tied to gold or I wish, you know, you had genuine market based money, but we don't, but then they're just bringing up these practical objections as to, you know, why these other countries can't seem to get it off the ground. So is your position just that, yeah, thus far they haven't set up a rival system, but I mean, with each passing year, the BRICS countries, I think gain in terms of the share of global GDP, let's say. And so at some point, you know, it, it it won't be a big as big a deal for them to have their own parallel network. Whereas, yeah, yeah maybe yeah. we understand why ten years ago they couldn't get it, or even five years ago, it still didn't quite work out. But that doesn't mean that's going to be the case forever. Yeah, exactly. I think I think that's right. Money money centralizes in a certain way, and there are a lot of incumbency benefits to to being the global reserve currency. I mean, 
when I look at history, Sterling was in the in in the portfolio shares long after World War II, long after Britain is no longer an empire, lost wars, lost all its foreign assets, uh, and isn't the mo- the dominant um, a factory of the world, the dominant economy of the world. Like uh, the money lasts much much longer than when the things that gave rise to it, the monetary superpower in the first place. Um, and you can see that if you look at you know Ray Dalio has his beautiful graphs in his uh, in his books, The Changing World Order, where he looks at you know the rise of different empires and the decline, and they be, they basically start start off with military might or economic might or production, innovation, things like that, and then the financial markets and the money follows, and then long after the empire itself is gone or the empire has been overtaken by some other empire, the money still remains. Um, so they're long, long sort of. It takes a long time for the money to switch, and there are switching costs going on, and so it takes a long time before you can sort of move the needle. Okay, um, so can you maybe elaborate then on wh- why isn't wh- why would these foreign governments spend all this time trying to recreate you know more conventional payment systems when hey, there's this thing called Bitcoin staring you in the face? Is it? Is it? You, I think you allude to it in your article. Is it partly yep. that the types of governments we have in mind right now are not particularly uh, favorable toward individual liberty, and so maybe they it's sort of like, yeah, Bitcoin would be good for us to be able to use to evade Washington, but we don't want our people adopting it en masse because then we can't control their money. Yeah, that's that precisely is. It, it puts these. Um you know, authoritarian leaders in a, in, in a weird position. Because on the one hand, they understand censorship versus money and, and money that you can't really stop. And it's very useful for them to do cross-border payments when the U.S. is sanctioning this and that and European Union uh, countries don't want to trade with them uh, or allow them payments through their banks. It's very, very useful, but they can't wholeheartedly embrace it because then their population also has access to it and then they can't really stop their population from doing the things that they want to do. Uh, for, for for what their leaders don't want them to do, so it's a little bit of a double edged sword in that sense, um, and so that's probably one of the reasons for why Bitcoin isn't a natural fit to these these countries. They have usage for 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 leaders and for for people in um, um, in, in 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 authoritarian countries or for dictatorships, uh, especially for for the population there, um, and to some extent also to avoid san- uh, sanctions and, and 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 do trade. Um, but it, it's not; it's hard for them to like wholeheartedly embrace it because they lose some of their influence over their own citizens. I think you know um, the credit, the, the social credit score stuff in China, and the monitoring and the surveillance. I, you lose a lot of that if you start pushing, pushing adoption of Bitcoin. Um, so, just on that front, I mean, there's. I don't want this necessarily to turn into a, a Bitcoin episode, but since we're bringing it up, I think. I know a lot of people are going to say, you know, be, besides the issue of uh, authoritarian regimes not wanting their citizens to have access to this means of payment, uh, aren't, aren't there? Aren't we encountering a lot of issues with Bitcoin right now? Like you know, high transaction costs, and then there's debates about, yeah, you're never going to use the you know, layer one Bitcoin to go buy a cup of coffee. That's more going to be like gold bars in a vault somewhere that occasionally transfer claims of ownership over. And then the under, you know, the day to day is something built on top of it. Do do you want to just weigh in on that since we're bringing it up? Yeah. um, I find it to be a little bit of a misnomer. A lot of people that I, that I respect in, in, in in the traditional economic economist field, uh, say George Selgin or Jim Rickards or other people like that, they tend to, dismiss Bitcoin on grounds that were relevant 10, 12 years ago, like in its very, very early stages. Mm-hmm. Um, if, you, if you'd look at what has happened in the last couple of years uh, with the development that's happened, the adoption that's happened, Lightning Network, side chains, different kinds of, um, um, of ways to interact with the net- network. It's like all of these tro- problems are solved. Like we have neat, obvious ways around them. And it's not like... I also often think about this too, you know, like somebody told me the other day, it's like, yeah, it, it, Bitcoin is never going to amount to anything. Like, look at all these people around you where we're sitting at a bar with tons of people around. It's like none of them know anything about Bitcoin and they are all transacting effortlessly. Yeah, that's true. But they also don't understand the monetary system that they're in. They're paying with a Visa card or a MasterCard in a bank app. They don't understand either. They just click a button. 
right? Like it doesn't mm-hmm. require a hundred percent of the population to be orange pilled to to change mm-hmm. a, a money or a payment system. Um, so yeah, I, I think a lot of people think of this or aren't keeping up at a lot of uh, developments that are happening. Okay, so for example, do you think in the year twenty fifty, a lot of people on Earth will conduct? a lot of their daily transactions denominated in Satoshis. I think so, yeah. Like twenty five, like 2050, that's 26 years off, right? Like mm-hmm. that's double the time that Bitcoin has already existed. If we think of it as any kind of like technology adoption or, you know, that, that's longer more or less than, than the internet has been mainstream. You know, like the, a lot of things can change in that time period. You know, like people, people have been using smartphones for half that time period, basically. Like, Technology is very accelerating in its pace, and things can change very, very fast when you think about them, if you look backwards like that. I don't think it's at all unreasonable. I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. Um, Of course, maybe it can take longer than we think. Maybe it just never happens. Maybe, like, the best thing that um, monetary authorities around the world could do to, to thwart Bitcoin or stop Bitcoin is to, like, adopt sensible monetary policy, you know, go back to a gold standard, things like that. And maybe mm-hmm. that happens. I don't know. Um, well, yeah, I mean, another, th- uh, and again, we're just kind of spitballing here um, while I have you, since this is your, one of your areas of expertise. Uh, w- what about uh, if rival organizations or groups l- like, yeah, some version of gold and it could be, you know, like, like tokenization. So the, yes, there's like a digital, claim asset that you can transfer on blockchains, whether they're semi-public or whatever, that ultimately are corresponding to some gold held in a vault in some neutral country somewhere that you think is relatively safe. You know, can you imagine things like that also coming to the fore or, because I know some people that are really big in Bitcoin say, no, the only real use case for blockchain is Bitcoin end of story. And these other things are trying to mix things that don't, that don't go together. Yeah, I lean that way too. I, I, mm. Shoving gold into into a blockchain is a little bit of recreating the system that that existed before fiat took over, and it's like fiat and fiat money money one out over gold and gold standard once, and if you just recreate it, you don't think it's going to happen again. Like you have the same problem with centralized gold in a, in a custodian vault somewhere, uh, even if it's a neutral con- country somewhere, and it's not in you know the vault of the Fed. Um, you're still subject to the same physical problem. There was some instance I don't remember the details, but a couple of, of years back, I think it was in response to the um, to the Ukraine uh, thing with Russia trying to to pay for things from abroad, and like they had they had withdrawn all of their gold to Moscow, and they were trying to like transact in gold, but it wasn't that easy uh, mm-hmm. because either you ship the physical gold to somebody to pay for imports. Or you need them or a third party to collateralize the gold, but you're physically holding the gold. So there was nobody who wanted to front you the money on the promise that you actually have the gold. So like, you're getting the same like physicality problem that gold always had. Even if you put a, a, a blockchain ownership on the gold coin, the gold coins are just still sitting somewhere and somebody can physically take them. Uh, and so that's that's one of the upgrades that gold can't really rival when it comes to the to the comparison between gold and Bitcoin. Okay. Um, and, and maybe we could just circle back a bit. So the issue of the regimes, because I, I don't want to give the wrong impression. It's at least where I'm coming from. It's not merely like when we talk about, oh, and the sanctions against Russia. or I can imagine some, maybe not the listeners of this podcast, but in general, like people in the financial markets might think, okay, so you guys are saying these pariah nations at some point might grow to be so big that the villains just all trade with each other, just like, you know, there's a market for stolen goods or something among thieves Mm. that, but, but I mean, it's, it's bigger than that though. I mean, it, it's like, I think a lot of neutral countries who aren't planning on invading their neighbor anytime soon looked with alarm at some of the stuff that the U S government did vis-a-vis Russia in terms of freezing assets and things. And just, you know, some regular merchant who happens to live in Russia, he's not invading Ukraine. He's not supporting Putin and yet his assets get seized. And so I think, yeah. or, so it's, it's not just governments thinking, um, oh, what, what if we at some point 
do something that the U.S. wants to go around and tells the international community is a war crime. But no, just if the U.S. decides to say that to some other regime and we disagree and we want to keep trading with people in that country, we don't think the U.S. should be able just to shut us off from doing that, which is what the case is right now. So it's it's not just yeah. that the U.S. Is, is penalizing Russia. It's penalizing anybody on Earth who wanted to have business with somebody in Russia. And that's a much wider yeah. net. And so I'm just saying, there, there, I think there's a growing number of people who make, you know, people with a growing amount of influence in, on world affairs who are realizing the U.S. government right now has too much power vis-a-vis yeah. the U.S. dollar's role in financial markets. Yeah, totally. And this is always a problem when you outsource sort of regulatory or oversight to somebody. As long as they go after bad people or as long as, you know, your side of the aisle are in charge, then 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 it's usually fine. It's like, I have nothing to hide. They're just going after bad people. Um, that works for as long as your guys are in are in charge. But then something happens, there is a new election, there is new people in charge, different ideas take hold, and all of a sudden you're on the other side of that trade. Uh, like once you outsource power that way, you need to you need to keep making sure that there are always good guys in the in office instead of having like actual neutral rules that don't penalize anybody, and then we can all just live happily ever after. Basically, um, I'm 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 exaggerating, but uh, you get my point that you know like mm-hmm. once once you give this sort of power, you can't really you need to take it back. Like this is it's not because you support the other guys who are doing bad things. It's that you see the writing on the wall, and it's not like the U.S. have been innocent in this case. Like they're they're blocking off a lot of people. You can, you know, names that get thrown around in in, in my quarters, like Ross Albrich or, or Julian Assange or Edward Snowden. It's like, yeah, where's the moral high ground in this one? Um, it gets blurry there, um, even if it's easier to to make a call for, morally speaking, for one of them for some of the other events, um, mm-hmm. the geopolitical events today. Like, do you think the, 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 the people who dash out sanctions are going to have the right judgment call for all the future sanctions? Right. Um, maybe the last thing we can touch here before I let you go is what, so a, a typical American here in this, like why should he or she care? Like in the grand scheme, does it matter if, if over the next 10 years, you know, the U.S. forfeits or the dollar loses its status, like what, what's the impact to the average person who lives in the United States? It might not. And depending on how, how fast it happens and how, uh, how, how big the reactions are, it might not matter very much. But you should keep in mind that uh, like America as a whole benefits from, from America as a whole. Uh, there are elements of American society and economy that, that benefits from, from, from global uh, reserve currency status, and when that goes away, those benefits are also going to go away. Like one, some 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 obvious uh, things that we have uh, some good estimates on are probably that most Americans, household and government, they borrow at lower rates than than, than other currencies, uh, and then people in other countries and other other currencies. There's a deeper um, financial markets, and there's more widely available credit that's avail- more avail- available more cheaply to you than in, in, in to a similar person in another country, in another currency. Uh, like So there, there are benefits like that that trickle down. The U.S. government can run bigger deficits than any other. If you think that that's a good thing for the population, like at some level there is a goodie coming from the U.S. government that isn't available to, to others, um, that's something that Americans benefit from. So I think at some level you should probably be, as an American, you should probably be interested in this. Um, and when you think of you know struggles that happen on the fiscal level or struggles that happen in your your uh, your country, they're not completely irrelevant from this or immune from this. Yeah, and maybe one way too to connect it to standard trade theory and such, like going back to the deficits without tears. So here, I'll say something that's you know, to do it more carefully in terms of the trade accounts and current account and blah blah blah. It'd be a little bit more nuanced, but big picture. If the rest of the world is willing to pile up dollar denominated fixed income assets, you know, other countries, other hedge funds around the world are willing to hold US treasuries, for example, even though their local currency is not US dollars, then that ultimately, yeah, means. So, why, what is the US, what are people in the United States getting in exchange for giving claims that they owe down the road to foreigners? 
well, the foreigners got to ship them goods. Yeah. Like that, that's what the trade is. That's that's why the U.S. would, would be willing to do that. Um, and so, yes, that it allows for the foreigners around the world shipping us imports on better terms than would be the case if those foreigners were not willing to just over the decades pile up more and more claims denominated in U.S. dollars. So then the flip side of that is if that switches and now foreigners around the world want to start reducing their holdings of U.S. dollar denominated assets, in a sense, it, it's you know loosely speaking, oh yeah, all those dollars come home to roost. Now, it's not literally necessarily $100 bills, even though in some cases it would be. <laughs> but you know the, the point being that so how, how could that, so the U.S. effectively would have to be a net exporter to that extent. And then how does that happen? Oh, it's because foreign goods all of a sudden become a lot more expensive from the perspective of Americans. So they would rather just buy domestically rather than import goods from China yeah. or whatever. And so what that means is the dollar exchange rate versus these other currencies could could drop significantly to make it such that all these accounting tautologies work out. Are you okay yeah, with that general to- story? Uh, yeah, I think so. But I think it's important to point to, to, to like, America is not a unit. It's not equal right. for everybody there. It's not one person who benefits somehow. Uh, and I think there's a good case to, to to make for why the American economy is so financialized uh, and is related to this. And also a lot of, you know, the manufacturing, outsourcing of, uh, of, of, of production, things like that. The, the, the Rust Belt stories are also related to this, this fact. Like America's main export is treasuries. <laughs> you know, like you send treasuries abroad or dollars abroad and you get goods and, and services in return. Um, if you stop doing that and, and, and the, these things run in reverse, you could very well see a, a resurgence of, of, of production in America, manufacturing industries, things like that. So that would benefit, let's say, you know, Rust Belt um, workers, companies at the expense of Wall Street, for instance. And you could have opinions on whether you think that's good or bad. Um, but it's, it, I think it's important to look at the nuances here that it's not a, it's not a country by country story. It's not, you know, America versus the world, or America versus Russia or China. Um, there are different people in America that benefit differently. Uh, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. Glad, good nuance there. So it's so they were deficits without net tears, but some people yeah. were crying even along the way <laughs> to get to. Where we <laughs> some were. people were crying along the way, um, and I guess it's uh, economist roles to figure out which ones uh, and how much, and what would happen in the in the absence of that, and what's going to happen in the in the reverse. Yeah. So manufacturing workers were crying, but then people on Wall Street and like consumers of cheap Chinese goods, they had tear ducts that were absorbing the tears back in. So, okay. Sure. Well, on that, we should we should wrap up. Uh, so where can people go to read more of your work? Um, I write for from the American Institute for Economic Research um, and from Mises Institute on occasion. Um, I'm on Twitter, but most of the time these days I'm on Noster. Um, and just search for my name, Joachim Burke. Um, all of my writing is uh, collected on a site called Authory, and it collects everything there. Just search for my name again. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, great. So, folks, my guest has been Wilkin Book. Thanks, Wilkin, for your time and your insights. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for tuning in. And remember to take advantage and get your copy of What Has Government Done to Our Money by going to mises.org/hapodfree. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.